Welcome to another episode of Tea Chat. My name is Quinn Bennett. I use he, him pronouns, and I am an outreach specialist with Mosaic. Today we have the pleasure of sitting down with the trans preacher, Joel. Thank you for coming today. Oh, thanks for having me. Um, tell me a bit about yourself. What do you do in your free time? Oh, I love to listen to music. I listen to hundreds of new albums every year. I go to ridiculous amounts of concerts. Uh, music is really my jam. No pun intended. <laughs> but, uh, that, that's my primary thing. It is, it is. Music mm-hmm. is very important. Yes, it is. So how and when did you realize you were trans? That's a, that's a really difficult question. Um, I knew very early in my life I was different. Mm-hmm. I was born in 1967, so there was not a lot of language or role models when it came to gender. Yep. I knew by the time I was a teenager that I was attracted to people of multiple genders. Mm-hmm. Um, and I knew how I felt within my own skin. And I also didn't know that other people didn't feel the same. Mm. I remember reading something maybe five years ago that said, cisgender boys are just happy to be boys. And it was like, <laughs> like, why did nobody tell me this? Like, I thought everybody hated their body. Right. I thought everybody did things in the mirror to look differently. Like, huh, wow. <laughs> So the only experience you know is your own. Um, You can look back in old pictures and see my posture. And when I came out to my brother and sister, they were both not surprised. (laughs) Um, And, you know, when I asked my sister why she wasn't surprised, she said, well, think about how you and our brother used to play. Mm. Um, So there were a lot of signs and... There wasn't a lot of language or role models to fully understand it. Yeah, so I imagine having not having the language and role models, as you said, made it difficult because you thought, yeah. as you know, your own experience, everybody felt this way. Right, and I I grew up in a very uh, conservative household politically and religiously, mm-hmm. and after that, I was in the Air Force for twenty years. Um, so that's forty years of life in not very affirming spaces Mm. uh, where there weren't really places where it was safe to explore. So how has your experience as a trans individual influenced um, your approach to preaching? Oh, it's, I think it's like any part of our identity. There's there's no way of separating who I am um, as a transgender person from my preaching. I think when it comes to understanding scripture, um, when it comes to preaching, there there is a particular view uh, that you get. And one of the things that I continue to try to articulate in in trans preacher and other forms are the gifts that transgender people have. Um, I'm tired of being called an issue. I'm tired of all the media attention we receive is in response to bathroom bills. And it doesn't seem like there's much emphasis on recognizing the unique gifts that we can bring into the world. So I believe things like God is a God of creation, not just billions of years ago, but God is always at work in creating new. And I'm a living manifestation of that. Um, I've spent my career in ministry seeking to draw the circle of God's love wide to include people historically marginalized by the church, Mm. whether that's because they're in poverty, whether that's race, whether that's as ethnicity. Mm. And if I'm honest, I want to draw that circle wide so it also includes me. Mm. That's very powerful. How long have you been a preacher? I've been a preacher for 18 years. Um, But like I said, I I grew up in a conservative family, um, a conservative church, and I never heard a queer person preach until I was 40 years old. Mm -hmm. And it was one of my seminary professors who preached a sermon called 
Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and us queer-ass folk. And it was the first time I ever heard anybody from the pulpit say that who I am is good, who I am is a child of God, who I am is a person with sacred value and divine worth. And so I very much want to share that message with other people. And was that the... Um, was that preacher kind of the spark then for... Yeah, yeah, he was very influential in my life. Oh, that's awesome. So as you talked about coming from a conservative religious background, um, like what challenges and discrimination mm. um, within religious space um, have you faced due to your gender identity mm. and how have you addressed them? Um, I'm a United Methodist pastor mm. and last week, I was at our general conference that's our global um, meeting of our church body. Um, normally it meets every four years because of COVID. This was the first meeting in eight years. Oh, wow. And we um, were successful in removing all anti-LGBT language from our book of rules that we call our book of discipline. Mm -hmm. um, there was language in there saying that people are incompatible with Christian teaching, mm -hmm. and now no one is incompatible. Yeah. Not We never were, right, right. <laughs> but we were called that. Right. Um, now um, people, queer people can get ordained. We can perform weddings for any two adults, regardless of gender or orientation. Mm -hmm. um, so last week was a very historic, very powerful week. The AP snapped a picture of me when I was bawling my eyes out in joy. Uh, they got circulated all around the world. Um, but that was the result of many people who came before me uh, advocating for that for 52 years. And so I've been a part of this denomination for 30 years. And always had to deal with the fact that there was, in our book, there was this discriminatory language. Right. Um, I serve at the Church for All People, and we are a place that believes all people are valued and worthy. Um, so we did not ascribe to those rules, right. <laughs> um, and yet those rules were still there. And... And there's still um, people in the world who call themselves Christian. Mm -hmm. And to me, the central message of Christianity is, is to love God, to love your neighbor, and to love yourself. Mm -hmm. And almost every day I get messages on my social media from people calling me the picture of mental illness, that I have a demonic spirit, that I'm going to hell, and these are other Christians. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's, it's sad to me um, that a faith that should be rooted in love is often used as a weapon mm -hmm. to try and control other people. Well, that, is, that is huge that that, that language got removed from... Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. It's, it's very huge. It's very huge. Right. So you were talking about um, Christianity and like the, the bigger message that people seem to push aside, I would say, mm -hmm. um, being, you know, love for God, love for your neighbor, love for yourself. Um, what, what other messages or teachings do you um, prioritize in your preaching to support and uplift um, the LGBT Q plus community and other marginalized communities? Um, I, I think the, the, the message of transformation and liberation is, is central. Um, the church I serve at is on the south side of Columbus in a lower-income neighborhood. Um, a lot of African-American people worship with us. And a lot of people who, for different reasons amongst all our intersectionalities, have been marginalized in different ways. And so I think there's both, for me, I would say the, the core messages that I preach are first to continually affirm that who
who people are as good and holy and sacred. At our church, every Sunday, we say, God loves everybody no matter what. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what you've done. You are a child of God. Mm -hmm. And we repeat those messages all the time. But I think throughout the week, people are hearing just the opposite. We have a lot of people who are homeless. We have people who are involved in sex work. Mm -hmm. And the greater society is telling them over and over again that they're not enough. Mm -hmm. And so to continually tell people you have value, you have worth, you are enough is primary for me. And right behind that is God came into the world to bring us life and bring it to you abundantly. Jesus in his first sermon said, I came to preach good news to the poor, freedom to the oppressed, um, to let the slaves go free and to free us from all the things that inhibit us from having a full life. Um, probably one of my core people who shaped my understanding of faith and of preaching is Bishop Desmond Tutu. And he said, you know, when, when we were under apartheid in South Africa, they gave us the Bible. And if they wanted to keep us in slavery, they should have never given us the Bible <laughs> because it seems like every page we read was screaming out liberation and screaming out freedom. Right. Um, don't give oppressed people the Bible. <laughs> and, and so that message of, of liberation is really important to me. Yeah, yeah I, really, um, I really like the messages of you are worthy, you are a child of God. Mm -hmm. Um, especially because, as you said, society throughout the week is telling the opposite. Mm -hmm. And for a lot of people, um, that might be the only place they hear that message. Right. So that's really important. And then the liberation piece, especially with uh, the current politics and what's mm -hmm. happening with all the anti-trans bills. Yeah. Um, like, how do you remain hopeful? That's a, that's a really good question. I've been at the state house a lot and under the current structure in Ohio, the Republicans have a super majority mm -hmm. and I continue to go to the state house to call out things that are wrong, mm -hmm. uh, to stand up. And, and I know before I go there, how the vote's going to go. Mm -hmm. And it's not only the votes, the things that when I leave the state house, that cause me pain are the characterizations, the language, um, hearing people like me compared to all kinds of horrible things. Mm -hmm. And just the, the lack of heart. Um, if you watch the testimonies from HB 68, you heard parents and children and doctors and all kinds of medical practitioners pouring their hearts out and trying to articulate how important it is for transgender youth to have health care. And it felt to me that all this outpouring of authenticity and sincerity was completely ignored. And, it, and that's this, the hard part for me. I understand we can have political differences and different political ideals, but to dehumanize people um, is just, I can't understand that. I don't have to agree with you on everything, but I'm gonna look at you and I'm gonna see you as a human being. And I feel often very unseen. Yeah, I would agree that a lot of, a lot of politicians tend to forget that we are all human beings. Mm -hmm. Um, for whatever their agenda is um, and to push that agenda. Yeah. Um, going back to, you mentioned that you grew up in a religiously conservative mm -hmm. household, and I know a lot of other people have as well, um, me included. Um, what advice would you give other transgender individuals who may be struggling to reconcile their gender identity with their faith? I think that the important word that you just said is faith. Mm -hmm. um, I am an ordained pastor, 
So I'm as much tied to religious institution as anybody could be. And I would be the first to say that religious institutions by their nature are human and broken. And even though we achieved great things last week, there is still much, much work to be done. My advice would be don't put your faith in the hands of institutions. Um, even when we're operating out of our best motives, we're human. We don't get it right. We still live in a world full of selfishness and greed, and that brokenness can come out. But I, I do deeply believe in, in a God who creates all of us and calls us all good, and a God that seeks us out, yearning for us to have a loving relationship and a God who wants all of us and especially those who are more vulnerable to have life and to have it fully. Um, And the religion that we use to try and connect with that and practice that is imperfect, but don't rest your faith in the hands of an institution. Yeah, I really like that. That's a very powerful statement. Um, Because I I would even go and say, like, any institution um, is is imperfect. Whether it's an educational institution, a government institution. And then we act surprised that the church, which is an institution, (laughs) is also imperfect. Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. Um, Yeah. So, uh, you know, you mentioned um, the gathering and the huge... Mm-hmm. Um, win that y'all had. Mm-hmm. What are what are your hopes and aspirations for the future of LGBTQ plus inclusion within religious communities? To hear more voices, um, for people to feel safe to come into positions of leadership. Mm-hmm. To me, inclusion isn't just you're welcome to come in and take a seat on a Sunday morning and you know act like we do and assimilate to us. Mm. Um, Inclusion isn't just tolerance. Inclusion means be part of the conversation. Um, Inclusion means sharing power. Inclusion means your voice being heard. Inclusion means who you are. You bring, whenever somebody joins our church, I would say, that person brings a unique gift to our community that we didn't have before. And inclusion is about making safe spaces for people to live out who they are in in all of our um, different identities. Um, And so my hope would be the church would grow more into being a safe place where a broader range of voices could be heard. I believe that across race, across class, across um, nationalities, and across gender and orientation. I feel like that's a very, very wonderful hope to have. The more, the more voices you hear, the more different perspectives. Like the more we can, like understand each other and connect. Before I came here, I worked um, a lot with the homeless community in Albuquerque. And we started a outdoor worship service with the homeless community. Mm -hmm. And one of my homeless friends coined the phrase that in each other's eyes, we see Christ. Mm -hmm. And I think behind that is none of us can understand who God is or what God is like. Mm -hmm. But if we're all created in God's image, you reflect something unique about who God is. Mm -hmm. And I reflect something unique and together we get a more harmonized picture. Yeah, that's beautiful. I, li- I like that a lot. Yeah. Um, is there any other things that you want to leave us with today? Um, or your social media, or if you're on social media? Yeah, I'm on social media at Trans Preacher. Um, invite you to follow. Also, just invite you to be a part of the conversation. Um, I'm one person just trying to make my way in the world and would love to hear other thoughts, other ideas. 
Um, I believe that collectively uh, we're much wiser than we are individually. So would welcome hearing other people's stories. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being Thanks. on the podcast. Yeah. Um, and thank you to our listeners as well. Um, this has been T-Chat. Thank you.